The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. My name is Krista Brown with the APS Technical Assistance Resource Center, APS TARC, and I want to welcome you to our APS Innovations Town Hall on APS Language. Next slide. with our facilitators Elizabeth Petrui from the Office of Elder Justice and Adult Protective Services Administration for, for Community Living and Chris Dubel, Director of the recently launched National Adult Protective Services Training Center and myself and I also want to acknowledge Andy Capehart who is uh, providing tech and moderation support today and Leslie McGee on the slides. Next slide please. Before we get started, I'd like to share a little bit of information. This webinar is being hosted by the APS TARC, which is a project of the U.S. Administration for Community Living, Administration on Aging, Department of Health and Human Services, and administered by WRMA Incorporated. Contractors findings, conclusions, and points of view do not necessarily represent the official policy of the federal government. Next slide. As many of you know, the APS TARC works with states to enhance the effectiveness of APS programs by working with partners on use of data and analytics, applying research and evaluation to practice, encouraging the use of innovative practices and strategies, and providing technical assistance to state programs. We're here to help APS programs in any way we can. Just reach out to us using the contact information that will be displayed at the end of the webinar. Next slide. And now a quick announcement for Let's Talk APS, announcing a new format for monthly peer support discussions starting October 2022. Uh, the APS TARC will now be hosting two informal collaborative peer calls each month via Microsoft Teams, one for practice and one for program management. And so you'll see the dates and times there. And so watch out for announcements with more information and how to register. And we are always looking for suggestions uh, for topics. So go ahead and hit us up. Next slide. Okay, housekeeping. Um, so the handouts of the slides and the discussion questions that were sent out to all registrants are in the handout section of the webinar control panel. You can download those at any time. Uh, please use your computer speakers to adjust your volume to your desired volume level. If you experience audio problems during our town hall, um, go ahead and I would exit the webinar and re-enter. Um, next slide. This town hall is being recorded and will be posted to the TARC website at a later date along with a copy of the slides and we will let everyone know when that is online. Everyone attending today will receive an email in approximately 24 hours with a link uh, for a certificate of attendance. And when prompted, please take the brief eval. We'd love to hear um, your feedback. And so today for this town hall, you may ask questions, share comments by typing them into the questions box of your webinar control panel or by raising your hand and unmuting yourself. Uh, next slide, please. So just a little quick, I think most people are um, familiar with GoToWebinar uh, participant panel, but uh, you can, if you have logged in with computer audio, you can go ahead and unmute yourself pretty easily. If you have um, called in using a phone, you must enter your audio PIN number to be able to unmute and, um, and talk with us. Um, next slide. And before you go ahead and unmute, just so that we don't have people talking over each other, um, go ahead and raise your hand and then we will um, work to select you um, and have pers one person speaking at a time. And again, the questions, I will be reading the questions out um, as well. Um, and next slide. Okay, just a quick attendee poll. I'm gonna launch this to see who we have with us today. Uh, what profession do you identify most closely with? Are you APS? Are you medical? Are you legal, research, ap academic, or other social services? Let's, we'll have that go for a bit and then we will close the poll. All right, a couple more seconds for the late votes. And there we go. Let me share that with you all. 
and predominantly identify as APS. Uh, and welcome to our legal, research, academic, and other social service um, partners as well. So let me hide that. And next slide. I'm going to hand it over to Elizabeth Petri, and she's going to go ahead and frame our conversation. Thank you so much, Krista. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Elizabeth Petrui from ACL's Office of Elder Justice and Adult Protective Services. Uh, it is my pleasure to serve as a project officer for several of the folks who I think may be on the call. And it was such um, so lovely to see so many folks from the APS field and from the research community at the NAPSA conference um, just a little bit over a week ago. So um, I wanted to take a couple of minutes just to talk about why we're hosting this town hall. Um, and so much of it has come out of the discussions we've had with states both before, but especially after the release of the formula funding through SIRSA and ARPA. Um, as you all know, language has always been varied across APS programs. Um, there's, there's a lot of things that vary from state to state and program to program. And language was a huge discussion when it came to setting up namers back in you know, 2014, 2015. The terms that are in namers were the ones that states could agree upon, but aren't necessarily used by all states. We also know that um, other related fields, such as those um, that deal with intimate partner violence, child abuse, have gone through similar discussions about what language um, becomes inappropriate, problematic, or more empowering to the people we serve over time. So there's just been sort of some increasing tension, friction, questions that we've heard around language. Um, and we wanted to open up the conversation, hear from you all to hear, are you hearing those same issues? Is this an issue at all? Um, we don't expect to solve anything today. So you heard Krista say, this is a town hall, not a webinar. Our intent is to hear from you to inform any future work that we might do in this area. And this is the start of the conversation, not the end. Um, I did want to give an example. And those of you who are who I serve as the project officer for may have heard me bring this up on calls in the past. But one of the terms that, that really rubbed me the wrong way when I started working at ACL and learning more about APS programs was the use of recidivism to describe APS clients returning and needing additional help from APS in the future. Now, I'm going to read you the very brief definition of recidivism from Merriam-Webster, which is a tendency to relapse into previous, a previous condition or mode of behavior, especially a relapse into criminal behavior. And if you scroll down a little bit on the website, it will tell you that um, English borrows recidivism from French, which borrowed it from a Latin source, which meant to fall into um, or to relapse into sin or crime. So you can imagine, like there are some connotations there that we definitely don't want to apply to APS clients. Um, but language also evolves and changes over time. So we want to hear from you. We want to we want to really appreciate everybody who's joined today to weigh in and to let us know whether you unmute yourself and talk verbally or you answer our questions in the question box or the chat. We so appreciate all of your feedback and are looking forward to the discussion. And I think now I am going to hand it over to Chris. Good afternoon. Good morning, everyone, depending on uh, where you're at. Uh, again, my name is Chris Dubel. I currently direct the National APS Training Center. Uh, a lot of you know me, um, but for those of you who do not, uh, I've spent about 22 years doing training and consultation for protective services at first, primarily here in Pennsylvania, but uh, increasingly throughout the country. So uh, I have watched as language evolves and language changes and some language as all of you know doesn't evolve because it's in our statutes or it's in our regulations or it's just embedded in our culture um, the one thing that's different for me today though is i'm not going to be doing the talking 
Um, I have some questions for you and I, we want to hear from you and we'll probably try to summarize or ask you a little bit more about those questions as we go through here. Um, but I want to start with a first question and that is, as an APS, as we grow, as we evolve, as we progress, what are some of the terms that you're aware of that your programs or the field in general is using that you think are problematic or outdated? You don't have to have the solutions to those terms yet. You don't have to know what the replacement should be. But what are some of those terms, words, phrases, that when you hear them, uh, you have the same reaction Elizabeth does to recidivism. So go ahead and chat, go ahead as, uh, and raise your hand if you would like to, to share a little bit more with us, but talk to us about what those terms are for you. So uh, it looks, looks like yeah. we have our first, it uh, looks like Kathy Greenlee. Okay, I'm gonna let you, Kathy jump in and then we've got some, uh, I think chats coming in here as well. Hi, Kathy. Hello, um, I wanna make sure I'm working my technology. Am I supposed to be seeing you people nicely and live in person or just your slides? Just our just, slides. Just, just the slides. slides. Uh, you're not camera ready this afternoon, huh? Okay. Uh, my, 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 my grandmother used to say, say I had a face for radio, so that's why we went this way. <laughs> Chris and I have discussed so um, he absolutely knows where I'm heading. Um, you know, I have been working for the last year or so with advancing states, you know, the membership organization of state aging, disability and Medicaid programs. About half of our members are responsible for adult protective services. And the phrase that I really stumble over is self-neglect. And we are launching kind of a multi-state um, initiative with a lot of support from APS members to kind of talk about self-neglect. Uh, I have a couple of, of concerns about it. I don't know of substitute language for self-neglect, and I know that self-neglect is often written into statute, but it is not a person-centered description. And so I've really been talking about at the HCBS conference, and honestly to anybody who'll listen, that we should at least start talking about people experiencing self-neglect, sort of like we've changed the language with regard to homelessness, talking about a person-first approach, people experiencing, um, homelessness, people experiencing self-neglect. It's clunky, uh, but I still cringe when I hear people talk about self-neglectors or, I mean, the, the word itself, the phrase itself is pejorative. It's accusatory, accusatory um, kind of like um, Crystal was pointing out, I think it was Crystal who was pointing out um, that the, the language is about recidivism. So, you know, the other kind of point I'll make on moving to person-centered language is when I was assistant secretary and and administrator at ACL, we did so much work across the fields of aging and disability, which is certainly the case here with, with APS. And I just feel very strongly that if we use language to describe people, and those people would not identify with the language themselves, it's not the right language. So I just want to you know, lead the, or, or be a part of the, the band as we move forward to just at least be person-centered. And I think if we, can do that, we can start to also characterize self-neglect in a way that we start to view it as an outcome of decisions and not the decision itself. So that's my that's that, that's where I'm trying to head. And and Chris and I had talked recently because I, I don't want to, in a leadership role with advancing states, go in a direction that's contrary to what APS leaders are thinking. But that's kind of where my thinking is right now on, on that particular phrase. Yeah, thank you, Kathy. Very well, very well said. Um, I, I just want to say something uh, to the uh, the staff. Uh, I hope you're seeing Mary's comment that the mic has maybe been turned off and chat disabled. So if we can address that. And Andy has. Okay, fantastic. So let me grab a couple of the comments uh, from the the chat, and then we'll see who else has their uh, hand raised. I uh, love what Victoria is saying here as client and, and consumer. Here in Pennsylvania, we use consumer. Uh, we've talked a lot uh, with the National APS Training Center about how much do we even use the word client versus calling Joe, Joe or Sally, Sally. So client, consumer. Um, Heidi, I think, uh, is agreeing a lot with you here, Kathy, of self-neglect seems victim blaming when it's often societal neglect. Um, 
Leticia, I'm not familiar with what a UAI is. I assume that's either some regulation or form that I'm not aware of, but that is still using the term uh, mental retardation. Nonverbal is something as people see regularly, Andrea uh, shares. Uh, we no longer use alleged victim. Uh, everybody is a client. Victoria, behavioral, as in person is having a behavior. Behavior is a form of com communication and should be honored and acknowledged. Uh, Victoria Gallic morse says using substantiated to refer to confirmed self-neglect cases. There's also been some discussion of whether we investigate self-neglect or do we assess self-neglect. So I, I think that's a very interesting part. Uh, Anna says the term elderly has ageist connotations. Um, Kat Preston Wager says elder adds to ageism. Vulnerable is this problematic? Um, there's a lot of discussion whether we should start by saying vulnerable adults or vulnerable older adults. Uh, yes, screening for, um, it's part of your screening form. Thank you, Leticia. Wheelchair bound, bed bound, uh, not using uh, person first language, uh, I think is excellent, Heidi. Alleged victim bothers me, also bed fast, um, Mandy shares. Ellen, victim may not, they may not see themselves as a victim. Do we have other hands raised of people who would like to We to, do have to share? one other hand raised, and that's um, Scott. Scott, I've unmuted you. If you'd like to make a comment, you can unmute yourself to do that. Scott, where are you from? I didn't know that was, uh, my hand was raised. I'm sorry, that was a mistake. Oh, okay, no problem. <laughs> it right. looks like Mary McGurin, though, also has her hand raised, so I'm going to unmute you now. Mary, if you unmute yourself, you can speak. Great, thanks, Mary. Hello, thank you. So there's um, several of us from Minnesota on, and we did uh, a, a community stakeholder engagement a couple years ago where we had 24 community organizations and 59 community conversations about adult protective services. And very much the comments were similar to what people were entering into the chat and what Kathy was talking about, that um, the language isn't person-centered and it's threatening and criminal justice focused. Um, and some of the, in addition to the terms that were identified previously, even report, you know, making a report against your neighbor um, did not sound like a warm um, approach. Alleged perpetrator, comments were already made about victim and vulnerable adult and self-neglect and um, investigation, all of those being just um, terms that people were not really comfortable with and that also were not um, culturally responsive or culturally relevant. Mary, do you mind if I, uh, would you be willing to share a little bit? Cause I know a little bit um, from hearing from your state, how you went up, I mean, we'll get to this a little bit more, but how did you make decisions from that? I mean, after getting all that feedback, what was kind of the process of how you filtered that feedback? Sure, after we had the, the community conversations, we met and the um, community stakeholder meetings, we had institutional stakeholder meetings as well with um, partners like law enforcement, um, attorneys, um, obviously APS, all, all of our different kinds of partners that you could think of, um, the Ombudsman's Office. And we then broke into solution groups and, this, and we had solution groups that worked through these issues with, with a facilitator and came up with um, a ranking of proposed solutions that were highly supported, um, supported, not supported, that, that sort of ranking so that we knew which amongst the stakeholder groups, which things were really clearly highly supported for um, modification or change in our system. Great, thank you. And, and part of the reason I asked you there to share that, Mary, is I caught Victoria's comment here, which I think is a real good one, and I'll catch some of the other comments as well, which is not everybody prefers person-first language. Uh, some uh, communities or some people with disabilities prefer identity first language. And so um, people who are deaf, you still hear me go to the default, deaf people 
uh, or aut people in the autistic community. So I was so raised in person first language that I still go to that tendency. But I think as Kathy Greenlee said, need to be calling people what they want to be called. So it's really interesting to hear you talk, Mary, about how you kind of almost went through a ranking uh, process. I wanna catch some more of the comments, but let me just ask if there was anybody that um, uh, has raised their hand. It doesn't look like we have any hands raised right now. Okay, um, let me catch a few more of the comments and then we will move on to the next question. Uh, Catherine says, uh, not the, the same question, but gender related language is an issue. And Catherine, I'm gonna just, you're welcome to raise your hand to speak or just chat a little bit more. I'm gonna assume you're talking about gender neutral language and being careful about that we are inclusive in our gender language uh, as well. If that's not what you're describing, if you don't mind chatting or again, feel free to raise your hand and we'll get you unmuted. Uh, Vic Victoria, I already caught Victoria's comment. Carry vulnerable adults. Our disability rights centers express concern with this language, and we've heard that across the country, that term vulnerable adults, particularly when talking with about or with people with disabilities. Um, there was another one in here, Chris, on yeah. placement. Um, oh, Heidi flagged perfect. as in the patient or client needs placement. Yeah. There's something very, um, you know, objectifying in a way of, you know, you, you might place an object, you don't place a person. A person has uh -huh. agency about where they want to go. Yeah. But see, I'm a reformed hospital social worker, so I still use placement all the time, but you're exactly right. Great point. Thank you, Heidi. Uh, Mandy also says suicidal is also a problem. Well, let's transition on that. And I'm going to ask Mandy if Mandy will um, uh, chat with us about what are some of those terms that you think we should be using? So the next question for you is on those kind of terms that we'd like to replace, what are the alternatives? And I'd love to hear from Mandy what Mandy is thinking as, as opposed to using suicidal, if you have the solution, Mandy, if not, that's okay. But as Kathy talked about, I think in, in, in the comments, it's not always easy to come up with the alternatives. But what are some of those things that you would like to see us start to use and shift with our language? And thank you, Mandy, for, for sharing this. Uh, they have experienced suicidal thoughts. One of the things you will see if, if, if you take a look at the National APS Training Center, we have started to use a lot of people who have experienced, even when talking about physical abuse or sexual abuse, not only self-neglect, but people who have experienced a particular situation. What are some of those other ways, terms, that you would like to see us as a broader field begin to use and advance our language. Let me catch Kathy's comment here. Uh, returning clients, repeat clients, something like that instead of recidiv recidivism and person experiencing self-neglect. Catherine says, who have experienced homelessness, for example. Victoria, non-speaking as opposed to non-verbal. Kathy also made a great point on that placement example. In the ombudsman programs, they talk about admission to a nursing home or other setting instead of instead of placement. Yeah, great, thank you. Looks like we do what have else? a hand raised if we great. were to unmute that person and I'm unmuting Heidi Richardson right now. Heidi, if you unmute yourself, you can speak. Hey, Heidi, how are you? Hi, nice to uh, be part of this conversation. Yeah, thank you. I wanted to comment on the term recidivism. I sometimes think that uh, I don't like that term either and haven't for a long time. But if we're successful in what we do and we give really good customer service, the hope is that the client we're serving would come back to us if they find they need help in the future. And we classify that as recidivism when really it might be excellent customer service and a trusting relationship with the community or the client. And, and it could even be a positive thing. I love that. That is brilliant, what I said. 
Thank you. Let's catch a couple more of the comments and then we'll see if anybody else's hands are raised. Um, let me see where I've left off. Uh, Kay says, "Will oh, that's a question about um, uh, the structure, but Mary says, adult vulnerable to maltreatment. Yeah, we, a lot of my language and the NATC language has talked about a person at times being vulnerable. Um, we've also, and I don't know, Mary, if, if, if you all are doing this, we've moved self-neglect out of a form of maltreatment. Um, sometimes I feel like we see maltreatment covering self-neglect, and that's one I'm not very comfortable with. Uh, oh, uh, Kat, yes, we do have time to throw this one in there. Uh, throw the word the word social worker in the in as problematic language, as well as capacity versus decision-making ability. We've had a lot of conversations with this as NABSA. Sometimes we refer to people in APS as social workers. The vast majority of APS professionals do not have a social work degree. And so I think that is a great point, Kat. And then capacity versus decision-making ability as well. Kay says person at risk instead of vulnerable. Mary says assessment in place of investigation. Mary also says person alleged responsible for maltreatment instead of perpetrator. Uh, Peter uh, says assessment as well in, instead of investigation. Thank you, Peter. Uh, what about using at risk rather than vulnerable? I think it's a great point, Ellen. And uh, Mary, great comments about on, on social work. Were there you other know, hands? Yeah. Well, I was just going to say, Chris, that is a great question because sometimes people might say APS workers, yep. but that's not very descriptive necessarily of what's being done. But not everyone is an investigator. Not everyone is a social worker. So it it does become tricky to find out what what is the term to use instead. Yeah, I think we need one. And, and you know this, Elizabeth, at the NATC, we've kind of used the term APS professional to be broad mm -hmm. to cover everybody in APS but we use the term APS worker for people who are doing direct. Some people will say APS frontline, but I always go, well, does that connotate like that we're in that battle or, or, or doing war? And so, yeah, I think we do need to think about what, what, how do we describe our role, particularly for the folks that are in the field? Um, how do we define uh, their role um, by language? Oh, I like uh, I like Dorian suggested front line or client facing. I like Ooh, client I facing. Client facing. That's yeah. Awesome. Thank you, Dorian. Yeah, as long as the state's using the word client. Yes, <laughs> of course. Maybe, maybe yeah, person, exactly. Maybe it's person facing, but I'm writing that one down, Dorian. That's really good. And I also want to catch Kay's comment here before we probably should move on to the next slide. Uh, this is great discussion. Thank you, everybody. Transition to another setting versus place or put person or take someone to another setting. I think that, that, that going along with the facility and and how, how we respond when we have to consider that as a service option. Anything else that someone wanted to say? Older adult instead of elder. Thank you, Kat. I will just put out there that elder in some cultures and communities is a sign of respect. So that is mm -hmm. one of those that um, has to be, we have to think a little deeply about um, if we're going strictly from the reframing aging or reframing elder abuse standpoint, then yes, older adult or older person is preferred. But <clears throat> I think we do, we need to be person, um, person centered with cultural considerations as well. So just like some folks may prefer that identity first language rather than um, person first language in the disabilities community. Yeah, absolutely. We're not, we're never, I think, going to find, you know, like this is the set of terms that works for everyone in every situation, um, which is why I said again at the beginning that this is the start of a conversation, not, not the definitive answer to any of these questions. For sure, definitely. And Dorian, elder is a sign of respect in my culture. Older would be more <laughs> offensive. You <laughs> calling me old? Laugh out loud. Thanks, Dorian. Um, All right. What? Well, if we want to go ahead and flip over. 
Okay. I think this one is mine, Chris. So yeah. um, it was, it's been really important to ACL um, in our, you know, in our ongoing work to hear from clients, to hear from the people who are actually receiving APS services. Um, you know, we recently finished up an APS client outcome study in which a major component was hearing, surveying clients directly. And so I wanted to put this out there. Have you received feedback from clients, people who you've interacted with in a um, client facing role as an APS professional on the language that APS programs use? You can un raise your hand to be unmuted or pop that in the questions box. And if I'll just add, if you haven't received any feedback, um, is there a mechanism by which you would receive that feedback? Okay, so Mandy has a comment and said, yes, I'm with intake and I've had some people get upset with me when I've asked them if they are the alleged victim. Not sure what alternative to use there. Um, Corolla says, I've definitely heard I'm not old when explaining what APS does. Oh, Dorian, yeah, we don't have a feedback mechanism and would like to work on this. Yeah, we have to build build those in when they don't exist. Do we have a hand raised? It looks like we did just have a hand raised. I'm gonna unmute um, Catherine Preston Wager right now. Catherine, you should be able to unmute yourself and speak. Thanks all. Um, hi, and I have heard anecdotally, not necessarily from clients, but from staff who said clients have had issues around protective. Mm -hmm. So in the APS, like protection, I don't need, you know, I don't need protection. What are you trying to protect me from? So just the word protective in APS. Yeah, that's a great point, Kat. I could definitely understand perhaps feeling that that's paternalistic in some way. Um, and there's a, we have another comment from Chrissy that says in Missouri, they use the term eligible adult because that is the statutory language for victim in quotes. So yeah, that, and eligible adult may be more, um, may be more descriptive um, in some ways, especially if your program is more focused on providing services than on investigating per se. Well, and also if your program um, serves 18, you know, mm -hmm. 18 to 59 and 60 or 65 and above. Um, yep. So Heidi adds, electronic records require consistent language to check certain boxes, and this can create issues with terms like alleged victim, which get built into our practice. Absolutely. If you pull on any one of these threads, you have to update your forms, you have to update your case management system, you have to update your trainings, you have to remember to use that language going forward. Um, any any one of these, even a small change, can cause significant ripple effects in trying to make it stick. Um, Joan says that she hasn't received any feedback from clients and they are yet to establish any alternatives. Well, thank you for being here, Joan. We appreciate you participating in the discussion. And Kathy, excellent point. It you we also have to update statute regulations and policy guidance in some cases so this is it's not a small thing we're talking about this can be kind of a big lift elizabeth though you missed the most important part of kathy's comment the <laughs> the ug at the end yes i think we we can all uh, relate to the ug kathy <laughs> those will def that will definitely be captured in the notes no just kidding All right, the pace has slowed a little bit on comments coming in. 
I will say that that oftentimes um, what Kathy brought up is a barrier to change, but I would mm -hmm. challenge us all, even though it's really, really hard sometimes not to let that be a barrier if it's what needs to be done. It just may take a while. Yeah, much like, you know, preparing for a, a challenging hike or some kind of adventure. Um, you just have to be prepared, right? If you, if this is important and we want to use the language that's the most appropriate and descriptive, we've got to be aware of what those challenges would be to make those updates. For sure. Um, Mary makes a great point that support is much better than protection. Everyone needs support sometimes. Amen. All right, well, let's go ahead and go to the next question, which is, what do you believe, and we've kind of already started to talk about this, what do you believe are the largest barriers to language change in your program or the larger APS field, and what are potential solutions to those barriers? So we've talked about, you know, um, how you were sort of raised in a program, like just how the words you were raised to use. We've talked about, you know, having to update forms, case management systems, statute, policy, regulations. Um, but how do we how do we overcome those barriers? And are there additional barriers that you can identify? Um, Victoria says statutory language differences across states will serve as a barrier to language change and consistent language use across the field. A potential solution would be to have language added to statutes that allow states to use the language agreed upon at the national APS level, and she puts in parentheses, wishful thinking. Um, Mary says the Elder Justice Act tied to federal grant funding defines APS as receiving reports and investigating the reports. Absolutely, so there's federal law as well. Um, years of language habit, Kat says, it's difficult to change. A solution would be having support to call people in rather than call people out to, um, to remind and refocus and provide the context of why or why are we using new words? Absolutely. Sometimes, you know, in my own family, um, I think my my mom or my aunts and uncles will be like, well, why do we have to change the way we've been talking? What's wrong with it? So yeah, we absolutely have to provide the context of why we think we want to use this new language. Um, Mary's point on a lack of national standards outside of the Elder Justice Act is certainly a barrier and a lack of stakeholder engagement to review and make changes. Um, Mandy has a comment on getting staff excited about using more inclusive language can be a challenge in and of itself. What is the payoff for them? How do we motivate people to use more inclusive language? That is a great, a great point. And I just want to pause there, Elizabeth, if it's okay, and, and engage yeah. Chris in that as well, because that's also, I feel like a, tra a training issue. Um, yeah, you expect me to have the solution to that? Yeah, Absolutely. Chris, come on. <laughs> no, and, and, and I, you know, and, and I wonder sometimes if, if for maybe even some of us on this call, but I think most of us on this call are probably in, in the already believer audience that words matter and we need to keep up and keep pace. But I think for some there, there can be almost this language fatigue. I'm going to learn this new word. I'm going to learn this new way of talking about things. And then somebody in the next year or two years is going to have me change it again and tell me that way of talking it, it is not appropriate. And in all of you on this call, know that APS is an extremely difficult job. It's a hard field. The I'm going to go back to it, the client facing, uh, our teams that are client facing, um, you know, they're trying to assess a really risky situation uh, where they're concerned that the person may not live uh, another couple of days if, if something isn't done. And 
we're now saying, well, when you talk about this situation, make sure you use this word, this word, and this word. And so I think that there can be some language fatigue. I think though, to your question, I think that is where training and education become really important. Uh, there's somebody on this call that has made a huge difference in the last nine months and how I think about some of the words we're even using at the national. I'm gonna call them out. That's Peter Larson from Minnesota. And, and, and so, just that kind of having people that are able to be progressive and kind of poke. And I do think that that is the role of education and training apart from even regulation and law is to challenge us, to challenge us as a field to say, are these the words that we should be, be using? Um, but I think it is tough. I think our, our teams can be tired. I think our teams can be like, what's, what's the value of this for me to change the language uh, that I'm using for someone else. We uh, we do have a hand raised. Uh, Kathy Greenlee, if you want to unmute yourself and speak. You all caught me on a day when I'm quite chatty. Um, so I have a comment. It's a little bit too complicated to just try to, to type, but it, but it relates to what we were talking about in terms of statutes and language and barriers. You know, the the concepts of substantiation has always bothered me from a public policy perspective because substantiation rates will be low given the nature of the work, even lower if the bar is real high on a level of proof. Like in Kansas, you have to show at an APS level, even clear and con convincing evidence that this person abused that person. And substantiation is very much about a pathway to criminal prosecution and whether you're starting to see the evidence. And this is not the majority of what APS is about certainly not the half of, of national cases, you know, where we're talking about self-neglect or even other situations where it, it does not appear that the, the conduct rises to the level of being criminal. So in terms of barriers, if we move away from a concept of substantiation, I think we have to go back and continue to work with legislators and other people about what it is we're trying to assess and demonstrate, not let go of the, the track that is very much about criminal activity, but some of this language sort of sets on a bedrock of misunderstanding about the program that I still think we struggle to overcome, especially if we head over to the legislature and want to do things differently. How you convey to them that we're not softening our approach, but we're, we're taking an approach that's more comprehensive in terms of supporting people. That would have been too complicated to type. Thank you so much, Kathy. I, that is, that could be a town hall discussion on its own of how do we think about the spectrum of programs that exist from very social service oriented to very um, not criminal justice, but investigation oriented. Um, and we've got, I think, another hand raised. We do, and I um, have unmuted Mary McGurn. If you uh, unmute yourself, you can speak whenever you're ready. Thanks, I just wanted to echo what Kathy said, because that's so much what we found with our stakeholder engagement was that people want um, support, they want reduced, you know, they want reduced risk, they want people to live in um, better circumstances to more consistent with what they want, but safer. And looking at substantiation as an outcome measure, it just does not align with what people really want from APS and what really makes a difference for people from APS. Thank you, Mary. Um, I wanna catch a couple more of these comments, which um, we had another one from Corolla on starting at the national level, perhaps you know, in the language that we use in federal funding opportunities, and then it might trickle down to the states. That's one way to potentially overcome a barrier. Um, Dorian, it looks like has left, but made an excellent a point uh, response to the fatigue comment that while yes, absolutely, this is hard work, people get maybe tired of having to learn new language, but that we should also focus on how we treat those we serve. That has to be one of the priorities in this work. Um, and then we had a comment from Joan, who is from American Samoa. Um, their APS program is relatively new, and so a barrier they're facing is um, really just convincing the community about the need for an APS program. 
that families are still protective over family matters, um, especially when they do not necessarily have all of the resources to address every single uh, form of maltreatment and that they are um, addressing that by actively focusing on outreach and face-to-face -face meetings with village councils. So absolutely, there, there are going to be um, cultural specific issues and barriers that will be unique to the, to the territories, for sure. All right, I think we have one more question. We do, and I will go ahead and, and take this one. And this question is, what are you doing currently? And we heard a little bit from Minnesota, what they're doing currently uh, to review APS language use. So um, what are you doing currently? Are you doing anything currently other than attending the town hall to get the discussions uh, started? But are, are there other initiatives, either similar or, or a variation of what has been done in Minnesota that you are doing um, to take a look? And Mary, if I can put you on the spot while some people are chatting, I'm, I'm very curious because I think this ties to uh, what we've been talking about this whole time is I know the or I know a little bit about the process that you've gone through. Have you designed anything to make sure that that process continues in the future? Do you have it set up like in two years we're going to review things again or we're going to go through this process or was this more of a kind of one and done type thing? If you wouldn't mind sharing. Sure. So um, it's not one and done. We're still in a phased implementation of all of the recommendations that we got through our Vulnerable Adult Act redesign stakeholder feedback as well as um, it really informed our APS operational plan. So our APS operational plan has ongoing um, projects for um, community conversations, um, especially with underrepresented communities, to get um, uh, more feedback from them about what's important to them, what they value um, and would value for from uh, protective services if they, you know, were more participating in the program. Um, so it's not done. Um, as far as language, um, we're just we're just we made several big changes this year when we changed our legislative um, when we changed our legislation to allow uh, an assessment track that everything doesn't go down quote unquote an investigation track. There's still there's still work done to assess the person and what's going on, but the focus is really on service interventions to stop, um, prevent, and reduce risk of maltreatment and not on that final determination. So we have a no determination track. So just doing those things, we're changing the policy at the same time that we're aligning the language with the policy. And we have um, ongoing plans to continue to do that. And obviously we have to take a look at our data and see what the impacts are of those things as well before we go too far down the path. Yeah, thank you, Mary, appreciate that. Other hands up, I see we have a um, comment in here, but other hands up before I get to the comment? Looks like there's not uh, any other hands raised right now. Okay. Uh, it, it's either Casey or Cassie. Uh, with new administration within, and I'm sorry, I'm not sure I'm gonna get the acronyms South. right. What's that? South Dakota and uh, Long-Term Services and Supports. Wow, that's good. That overseas APS policy, and uh, procedures are being reviewed and updated. And I'm assuming that's including kind of language and, and, and looking to see uh, what language is being uh, used. Great. And that's that's Cassie okay. from South Dakota. Sorry, Kathy, I messed that totally up for you, but thank you for that comment. Others, anyone else? And hopefully you all saw in the chat box, uh, Krista has put a link um, to the APS TARC podcast discussion with Minnesota about this process that they have undergone. Give me just another moment to see if anyone else has been doing anything um, Krista, Mary did send in something that the chat is disabled. Is she still able to see that chat message that went out to the entire audience? Um, 
I am not sure, and I'm not quite sure, Mary, why your chat is disabled. Um, yeah, and uh, it, it can be a little confusing because our chat is at public. If you type something into the chat box, it goes to the organizers. It doesn't go to everybody on the call, so that might be some source of the of the confusion. But um, Mary, you should be able to see the message that Krista just put in the chat box. Right. Okay, because we were seeing some folks who said they did receive the link. Mm -hmm. So. Right, and Mary, it's um, it's a podcast that you did, so you are intimately aware of it. <laughs> so uh, it's the um, your awesome podcast. So, all right. Well, don't think I'm uh, missing any chats. Anything else, uh, Elizabeth, Krista? You wanted to jump in on that that last uh, question, or Andy, or anyone else? I don't think so. I guess I would be curious, excuse me if you just heard my dog bark. Um, <laughs> she has a lot to say about this. Um, if I hope that this town hall maybe inspires some folks to think about reviewing their language use, even if you're not currently engaged in that process. So if, if this does inspire you, let us know. Indeed. Yeah, and I, you know, to the, to the question earlier about education and training, and and we'll we'll end and talk a little bit about what we've been doing as well as some next steps. But um, you know, we always want to use language that meets our, our team's needs and doesn't outpace them too much. Um, but I do think that there is a role for education and training to kind of help expand how people think and how they think about words. Uh, on the next slide, after this question slide, there are resources. And these are just several of the resources that we discussed and kind of put together, actually Krista uh, put together for us, um, but uh, are great resources to kind of look at language and how other national organizations are using language uh, when talking about uh, people. And so you've got the AMA, uh, American Psychological Association, Equity, Diverse, Diversity and Inclusion, Inclusive Language Guidelines. We happen to use that one a lot uh, for the National APS Training Center. Uh, the article uh, by David Burns and colleagues National Association for Social Workers, and then National Center on Elder Abuse, Reframing Elder Abuse. So those are several other resources. I'd encourage you, if you know of any resources, go ahead and just put those in the chat as well. Um, someone said that they can't hear me anymore. Is that, are, are others hearing me? I, I can hear, still I hear you, me, Chris. Yeah. yeah. And All since right. the chat is disabled, they can put well, those I was thinking, in the question. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, in the, que in the question where, where you have been uh, putting your responses. But if you have other resources to share, um, let us know what those are. Next slide. Just share with you again, the National APS Training Center is launched. Uh, if you're not familiar with what we're doing at the National APS Training Center, this is a uh, project administered by NABSA. Uh, sponsored by the Administration for Community Living. It is to provide free uh, education and courses uh, to APS across the country. And so hopefully uh, you'll get a chance to check out the courses and tell us what you think, as well as tell us what you think about the language that we've used. Um, we have spent about the last nine, 10 months, much of it discussing the language that is appropriate. We've had to take into consideration not only language at the state and local level, but the language at the national level as well. And so we have developed as part of that, and it's only in its beginning stage. So if you go to the NATC, you will see our first uh, go at a language guide. But that language guide for us at the National APS Training Center is both a glossary, a definition of the terms that we are using, but also provides some explanation as to why we have picked those terms. We picked the term because it's supported by the American Psychological Association. 
or we pick the term because it comes out of the ACL voluntary consensus guidelines. So not only are we defining terms, but we are also uh, giving you some level of here's why we're using that term. For the core courses that we have built so far, we have also made them so that they can evolve as our language evolves. We've made it a lot easier to go into those courses and progress our language as we learn how to say things better, articulate better the mission, the values of APS across the country. So we hope that you will take some time uh, to, to check us out. I know we have some of our partners here from San Diego State University and the Academy for Professional Excellence. Um, and we may have some other partners here as well. I didn't see everybody that was on the chat, but there's a lot of people that went into this, as well as the NAPSA Education Committee that I know we have some representatives on this call and we talk all the time about what's the best language to use. So hopefully you'll check us out and, and give us some feedback. I'll go ahead to the next step slide. All right, thanks Chris, thanks Elizabeth, thanks everybody. This has been really, really great. So if there are other questions or comments, please, please, please uh, go ahead and send them in to us. And if you had colleagues or other folks who wanted to join but could not um, and want to weigh in, please have them um, send that in to us. Uh, we are currently here at the TARC uh, planning for federal fiscal year 23. And I saw quite a few comments about wanting to kind of see a a synthesis of, of the comments and, uh, that we have gathered here, and I will work with um, our TARC and ACL team um, to try to get something out to folks. Um, probably gonna need to give us a little bit of time, um, and then we are going to take all of this into our planning and figure out what next steps are for us here at the TARC. Um, I do want to thank you for your participation. This is this was awesome um, and makes me want to do more of these types of things. Um, next slide, please. And of course, you can contact us and follow us um, at these different channels. Thank you so much for your participation today, and we will see you next time um, here. Take care, everybody, and thank you, thank you, Chris, Elizabeth. This was great. Thank you, Krista. Thank you, everyone. Bye, everybody. See ya.